this proud young couple are set for a Sunday spin. Their horseless carriage was new in 1913 when motorists wore linen dusters and wind. Things were tough for the people who owned the first automobiles. Horse and buggy roads were hard on automobiles. Every man who bought a car joined the campaign for better highway. Motorists pinned their hopes on the new state highway department organized in 1905. They supported legislation that gave the department authority to build trunk lines between the major cities. These trunk routes became our first state highways. Shortly afterwards, the department was asked to help the towns plan and finance road construction. The federal government began to contribute in 1916, when Congress passed the first Federal Aid Highway Act. We owe our modern highways to the cooperation of town, state, and nation. They're working together to give us better roads. The State House in Augusta is headquarters for the hundreds of men who work at the job of building and maintaining the state's highway network. Let's go upstairs to the Highway Commission offices. Meet Mr. Lloyd B. Morton of Farmington, Chairman of the State Highway Commission, and his fellow commissioners, Mr. Cornelius J. Russell of Bangor, Mr. Harley D. Welch of Chairman. These three men, who are appointed by the governor, direct the work of the department. It's up to them to make the important policy decisions. Mr. Lucius D. Barrows has been a member of the department since 1910 and chief engineer since 1927. This electric eye counter helps the commissioners to settle the big question. Where will new construction benefit the greatest number of people? What roads take the heaviest traffic? Every time your car passes one of these counters, it interrupts the invisible... The eruption is recorded on one of these rolls, which you see now being removed from the machine. Your trip, for business or pleasure, becomes part of State Highway Department statistics that show shifting traffic patterns. There are 10 of these stationary electric eye counters in different parts of the state. Here is one of the 34 portable counters used for special projects. Let's look inside the cover. This electrically operated mechanism reacts to pressures received on a rubber tube stretched across the road. When your car wheels cross the tube, they create an air impulse that's recorded on the machine. Two impulses equal one automobile. An employee in the planning division makes the rounds, removing the record tape, placing a fresh roll in the machine. The counter is 93% accurate and will do the work of three men. It's used wherever a special traffic survey is needed. Designers must know what speeds the new roads will be expected to accommodate. This machine uses radar to tell the planners how fast you drive on the average. The needle moves to show the speed of an approaching automobile. A planning division worker records the dial readings. His report will help the engineers to design safer highways. It's one thing to gather information, another to interpret it. Tabulators in the planning division assemble reports that will tell the engineers how many automobiles will be on the road and how fast they'll be driving. They tell him how many heavy trucks will use his new highway. He bases the design of the road, its width, grading, and resurfacing on this information. The report also indicates trends that enable the planners to keep one jump ahead of the present with an orderly, long-range program of highway construction. Planning has indicated that a cutoff is needed at this spot. Surveyors run the center line of the new road through a cow pasture. The engineer at the transit indicates just where the center stake shall go. His assistant pounds it down. It's one of hundreds of painstakingly placed markers. We're ready now for the next stake. A surveyor moves the red and white pole in response to the transit man's signals. 
finds the exact spot. Let's double check that. He notes down the distances. The surveyors have measured 50 feet out from the center for this side stick that will guide the construction crews after the center marking has been obliterated. This is healthy outdoor work. The boys use bush cutters to clear a path through a patch of scrub wood. A four-man surveying party will work a week covering a mile or a mile and a half of new road. They go over the same terrain four times, making different calculations. Now there's a clear view. The transit man has set up his instrument. A surveyor is checking the elevation at hundreds of different points along the proposed route. It's exacting work, but his figures will tell the designer how many cubic yards of fill or excavation will be needed. Engineers want to know what kind of soil will be under the roads and bridges they're designing. This raft and the equipment mounted on it helps to take soil samples, even in deep water. The hammer is driving a hollow cylinder deeper and deeper into the underwater mud. Now, water is forced down the pipe under pressure to wash bore a deeper hole. Workers have brought up the soil sample. They're ready to dismantle the pipe and unscrew the section that contains the soil. These men take great pains to make sure that the sample remains undisturbed. They prepare it carefully for shipping. A brass cap covers one end. A fire has been started to melt wax that's poured into the pipe to seal the other end. The sample goes to the soils laboratory at the University of Maine, where a worker splits open the cylinder. The laboratory is ready to begin a series of tests that will show the characteristics of the soil. A compaction test is started by a University of Maine student who gets practical experience in the laboratory, run as a cooperative activity of the university and the highway department. Now the pressure is on. The series of gauges controls a machine that applies gradually increasing weight to an unsupported column of earth. Experts will judge the strength or bearing capacity of the soil by noting the point at which it begins to break. When the column fails, usually by shearing off at an angle, the engineer will know how much of a load the soil will carry. A technician takes notes on different soil samples sent to the laboratory from highway sites all over the state. The rock cores at the right were obtained by diamond drilling. The laboratory worker puts small steel balls inside the cylindrical tumbler. Next, he adds weighed and sieved rock for a test that will indicate the wearing quality of the rock. The cover fits on tightly and is fastened by bolts. Now the cylinder revolves, knocking rock against metal. If the rock is soft, it will wear in the tumbling process. If it's hard, there will be little change. The worker has emptied the cylinder, and now he's shaking the sifter vigorously to separate dust and rock. The worn down rock left in the sieve goes on the scale. He compares its weight with the original weight before the tumbling wore some particles to dust. 
these before and after comparisons telling whether the rock is tough, durable, or soft and easily worn. The cylinder of concrete goes under a press. It has been carefully cured and handled under simulated outdoor conditions. A technician at the Highway Testing Laboratory at the University of Maine manipulates the controls that apply gradually increasing pressure to the concrete. How much will it stand? Have cement and sand been mixed in the right proportions? That's what the highway engineer wants to know. The cylinder is crumbling under increasing weight. It reaches the breaking point. Here are the engineers who tie it all together. In the drafting room in Augusta, they consider the statistics of the planners that reflect your driving needs and the technical data of the surveyors and soils experts. Out of this information, they design the shape of our new highways. It's up to them to decide the grade of the new road, to compute the cuts and fills, to figure the amount of gravel base that will be needed and the amount of surfacing. All this information goes down on sheets of tracing cloth to make blueprints to guide the construction crews. The engineers work out every aspect of the job in detail. They make an average of 12 to 15 sheets to a mile of road. Plans for a big job make a fat volume. Henry D. Fallon at the left of the U.S. Bureau of Public Roads talks over construction plans with Ernest L. Merrill who has charge of construction on Maine's trunk highways. This room at the highway department is the scene of a frequent drama. Private contractors gather here to find out which one of them will be awarded the big road and bridge construction jobs planned by the department. The sealed bids that they have entered are opened for the first time by the commissioners under the eye of the competing contractors. One of the commissioners is holding a bit in his hand. He slits open the envelope. Hands it to Chief Engineer Barrows, who reads aloud the sum bid. Men listening to him take notes of their competitor's bid. They know that the job will go to the man who stands ready to do it at the lowest cost to the state. The earth movers take over. The bulldozer is the chosen tool of the engineer who wants to rearrange the landscape. It flattens hills and fills in gullies, makes roads straighter and grades easier. It does the work of an army of men. Companion of the bulldozer on a big construction job is the power shovel. This diesel-powered machine is gouging into the earth, excavating along the new route. Its steel jaws are big enough to handle large boulders, and excavate soft lead. The shovel stripped off the dirt along this stretch, but there's hard rock underneath that must be blasted. Workers are busy with wagon drills and hand-operated jackhammers. The foreman decides how much dynamite he needs for the job. Different colors of these lead wires indicate the interval between the setting off of the charge and the blast. The attached exploder fits into the end of the dynamite stick. Now a half hitch with the wire so the dynamite and the exploder can be lowered down the hole deep into the heart of the rock. More dynamite follows the wired stick, they tap it down with a pole, and now his helper fills the hole with dirt. Workers are piling brush on top of the buried dynamite. This ledge is near a group of houses, and the contractor is careful to smother the blast. A heavy steel net goes over the brush to weight it down. They're using a truck winch to haul the net into place. This man will set off the charge. He stops to test the wire. Everything's all set. He connects the wire and the exploding battery. All set. A controlled explosion muffled by the brush and the steel net. One more obstacle out of the way. The contractor is ready to begin surfacing. First step before laying the surface is to check the grade of the gravel base by means of this string, carefully stretched between iron pins. Gravel underlies all our highways to depths varying from 18 to 30 inches 
depending on the type of soil. The road slopes toward the shoulders for drainage. A truck moves slowly forward, dumping crushed rock into a spreading machine. This rock was tested for wearing quality in the cylindrical tumbler you saw at the highway testing laboratory. It's been crushed, screened, and graded uniformly to sizes not larger than two inches or smaller than three quarters of an inch. This moving bar passes over the rock as it goes onto the road, spreading it evenly. Here's a man with a keen eye. The foreman squints down the road to spot the uneven pieces. A few rocks are thrown to one side. Now the roller is in action. Engineers call this compaction, which is a technical way of saying that the crushed rock packs down more closely under pressure. When the roller has finished its job, the stone will be an even three-inch layer over the base. The emulsified asphalt goes on the rock at the rate of three-quarters of a gallon for every square yard of surface. It will bond the rock together, make it into a smooth, easy-riding surface. A pressure distributor in the truck is forcing out the asphalt, controlling the rate at which it goes on the road. More rock. This is keystone, graded to a size of one-half to three-quarters of an inch. It fills in the spaces between the larger stones. Men in the truck keep the rock shoveled into the spreader, which drops it evenly on the road. Here's a job for a half-ton truck. It's pulling a set of brooms bolted to a board frame. Two men ride the frame, weighting down the brooms as they drag over the keystone sweeping it into the chinks between the larger rocks. The second coat of asphalt goes on at the rate of one and a quarter gallons for every square yard. The crew repeats the process that you've just seen as the layers of surfacing are built up. This asphalt truck will make two more trips over the road applying seal coats of approximately three-tenths of a gallon per square yard each trip. More keystone is shoveled into the spreader. It will be tightly bonded between the different layers of liquid asphalt. Workers surface a long stretch of road in sections. This heavy paper is used to make smooth joinings from one section to another. The uncovered paper is pulled up, tossed away. The broom drag appears again to sweep in this second coat of keystone. A broom is a housewife's tool but it seems to find an important place in road building. After each layer of rock, the roller is on the job, packing it down under 10 tons of pressure. This roller will give the new road the compactness it needs to stand up under the pounding of traffic. Here's our finished road, and surveyors are busy again. They're taking cross sections at right angles to the line of the highway. When they've finished, their figures will show how many yards of dirt and rock have been ruled. This determines how much is due the contractor will be paid according to the amount of material he has moved. Back at the State Highway Department office, engineers are working up plans for a new bridge. They've started complex computations for the structure that will replace an old, unsafe bridge in one of our smaller main towns. Bridge design is one of the most exacting engineering jobs. Here, the slide rule, nicknamed a slipstick, goes into play as the engineer makes a calculation dealing with the stresses. Reconstruction of the bridge has already been approved at a hearing by town, county, and state officials.